You may have noticed a few changes, even though uh, we, have this, we have the same MC on Ralph Hill. Half of you might have seen me, and half of you know who is this guy. But I bring you a very warm 99 degree greeting from Topeka. Welcome to Kansas, and greetings from the home of our state legislature. With uh, Representative Schreiber, are you here? Mark, are you in the house? Mark, good to see you. Um, I, I do not acknowledge the education funding bill did pass this year. It correctly did. We have education funding in Kansas. If you do decide to come here, we will take care of you. The other change is we would normally introduce each teacher by showing that video and then having that go. Now you've seen them all. They're, what a fantastic double-header class. <laughs> so now, uh, I'll just introduce each teacher, and they will say thank you, and they will join the group. So we've already watched the videos for tonight, and, and really uh, give these teachers the credit, they, the extra credit they deserve very quickly. I wonder if, uh, since we're applauding, if you thank Sodexo for the terrific meal we had tonight. Well, And let's see, Paula Sauter, we extend our appreciation for the beautiful creative centerpieces this year. Paula, thank you for that. And uh, each year we're fortunate to have some of our Hall of Fame members come back to the Emporium sharing in the recognition as we pass it down from generation to generation. They welcome the new classes of which you all 10 of the inductees. So I'd like to ask all of our Hall of Fame members from previous years who are in the house tonight, would you all please stand up and get a round of applause? <laughs> Him especially, good to see you again. I always love seeing you. And I got on a knee one time and I gave her her ring and asked if she would, I got on a bended knee if she would please be a member of the Hall of Fame and accept our proposal, so she did. <laughs> that. Oh, we'll make some more tonight. So the National Teachers Hall of Fame supports and recognizes all of our teachers, past, present, and future, of course, is one of the main reasons we're here. And in fact, the banquet is in honor of everybody who is teaching. What a year for our schools, right? We're honored to have an attendance of career educators who've been inducted into the Kansas Teachers Hall of Fame that's located in Dodge City. So will our state Hall of Fame teachers please stand up right now? Where are you? Have any of those? We're thinking about you. All right. <laughs> we have some, some former Kansas Teachers of the Year. Do we have any Kansas Teachers of the Year? This is your chance. <laughs> Master teachers, are any of you here? Are master teachers? <laughs> so, thank you for being with us tonight. Carol, thank you for being with us tonight. And congratulations on your job. So, now all of our educators, would you please stand up for a round of applause? This is your chance. Kansas State Board of Education. Our Board of Education. <laughs> Members of the 
these state border regions. But just the proofs of some tuition freezes this week, we reported on the news. Is that why none of them are standing out? <laughs> the border region, we, we love the border regions. Members of the Kansas Department of Education, are you here tonight? Any of our education members? Okay. Also, want to recognize, I'm not going to say anything about that. I want to recognize somebody who fights hard in the Kansas legislature for quality education. I did chat with him earlier, uh, Representative Mark Schreiber of New York. Would you like to come up and say anything, Mark, or just get a round of applause? Okay. <laughs> Thanks to all of you making education a priority. Well, on behalf of the Board of Trustees for the Hall and the members of the Hall of Fame, we want to recognize the host of volunteers, the people, and the groups and businesses making all this recognition and all these honors tonight. We're in this new fancy ball this year doing all this. We're doing it again. As I was saying three years ago before it was rudely interrupted, we were in White Hall, but now we're in the ballroom. And welcome back. We're going to do this in person again. That's fantastic. So for the, uh, the people and organizations and the businesses making all this recognition possible, time uh, won't allow us to, you know, do them individually. So uh, we'll just have them collectively. They're all listed in your souvenir Hall of Fame program on the Apple on the front. A very long list of thank yous for people behind the scenes. And uh, now we have a category. This is where I ask you to do your assignment, follow your homework, follow what Carol Strickland says, our main teacher here. So stand as I'll the categories of supporters, and the homework is see if you follow your assignment. So please don't applaud until I get through the whole list here. We'll send everybody breaks that rule. Uh, members of the National Teachers Hall of Fame Board of Trustees and members of the National Selection Committee stand up who select our teachers. Okay. The host families that are so crucial in getting our teachers from out of Kansas around Kansas. They always. Carol, we did it again. And that's fine. The Friends of Education and the Friends of Financial Country to make this banquet and all the other events possible this week. Our corporate and our education partners, would you please stand up? One of the three founders of the National Teachers Hall of Fame and an emeritus board member, Mark Andrews. Mark, are you here? Please stand up. And of course, the Hall of Fame Administrative Assistant, Jennifer Baldwin. Probably sorry at the front that you were coming in. Jennifer is amazing. And our champion volunteers, Scott Cates, and our host of hard working volunteers. And now we can applaud for So thanks for being with us, and this is the 30th annual induction ceremony we haven't had since 2019. And uh, we're going to take a little bit of a short break. We'll continue with the induction ceremony. Uh, once again, the induction ceremony it had in the past, it had included all 10 of the videos. We've seen all of those. And uh, Carol, there, there's a QR code uh, is on the program. If you see on the back of your program the QR code, which we did not have those three years ago, you can scan your QR code to watch the videos again, probably after you've seen them here on stage, you want to do that. So uh, we'll do a little stretch break, we'll take a very brief break here, and we'll start the induction ceremonies, and we'll welcome all of our people, really, who can get to watch this around the world. At Emporia.edu, we'll, we'll have the live stream of the ceremony, we'll uh, fire up the computers and do that. So we'll be back in a few minutes, we're so grateful you're here, this is going to be an awesome night, as we've done for two classes, we have a double header, and we'll start it in a few more minutes here. We'll see you. My name is Drew Bider. I have the privilege of teaching six classes of modern American history at Springville Middle School, located outside of Buffalo, New York. After I started around 25 years ago, I found it so exhilarating to create lessons on things that mattered and to see the joy on my students' faces recreating situations like Ellis Island, the Great Depression, or being in Congress. It made me realize that the study of history had the power to change lives. This became especially true after having a local Holocaust survivor come into our school whose name was Joe Diamond. After witnessing his testimony, I remember hearing the voice of a student who asked, what can we do to help make the world a better place in our time? After receiving some training from several amazing organizations, 
a few local teacher friends and I decided to answer that very important question. We called it the Summer Institute for Human Rights and Genocide Studies of Buffalo, a five-day program that provided the knowledge, tools, and inspiration for students to make a difference in their world. In the past 12 years, we've been able to train over 500 young changemakers, reminding them that it's important for all of us to use our talents for the benefit of humanity. It was around this time that I realized something equally as important. It was crucial that I do my part helping other teachers learn about these important topics as I have been trained. In 2011, we were able to start the Educators Institute for Human Rights, a nonprofit designed to provide teacher training on the Holocaust and human rights education in Rwanda. From there, our staff was able to branch out to do the same in Bosnia, Cambodia, and the United States. Since that time, it's been inspiring to see others whom we train do the same for teachers and students in their part of the world. Around the same time here in Buffalo, the staff of the Summer Institute created the I Am Syria program to provide educators from around the world with teaching materials about the crisis. Over one million hits later, this momentum led to the creation of other websites that did the same for educators on the most important topics of our time, and conferences too, on other important issues of our day, such as how to teach about immigration, civil rights, media literacy, and climate change. It's a simple equation after all. What a society puts into its teachers is what it will get out of its future. As an educator, I've been fortunate to have a great group of friends, family, colleagues, and administrators that have loved and supported me along the way. Working together, my hope is that we have laid the groundwork for teachers and students who have yet to be born, inspiring them to stand on the shoulders of the giants that have come before us. My hope is that I've been worthy of this opportunity and that I've done my part to inspire others to make our world all that it can be. What we do matters, and our time is now. Well, the foundation for my teaching philosophy has always been the, you know, the student and caring for students and getting to know students. And that's sort of been the theme throughout my career. But through the years, it's evolved into different phases. I spent some time, you know, coaching, which, you know, was in the classroom coaching, you know, and coaching, which develops even deeper relationships and connections with the community. And then I just uh, got into the classroom. And I think the big change was when I realized that this generation and the last generation really have a strong passion to want to make a difference. And from that basis and from wanting them to excel, I thought, well, how can I allow them the opportunities to make a difference? And so we started down this pathway and this journey to problem solving and allowing them to find a passion, find a problem, and try to find a solution for it. I think the, the big turning point was probably when I personally went overseas and made a trip to Africa. And then years later, as I was relaying that trip and things about that with my students during class, they really were so excited and realized that there were opportunities, international opportunities, to try to make a difference. And that's when we began a campaign called Aqua for Tharaka, targeting Kenya, orphans in Kenya, and bringing clean water to them and protein to protein deficient uh, villages and orphanages. What that did is it just really gave my students a lot more autonomy. And for that, they began to get exciting when they started very excited about seeing, oh my gosh, I'm really making a difference, not just internationally, but also locally and nationally, that they were seeing that what they were doing actually could be relevant to solving a problem, to helping people when we took it to the next stage and went out of the country international that's when it really exploded and students were just I want to be involved because I want to be a part of solving a real world problem and I want to be part of a solution that's going to help people who are less fortunate than I am and then it just extended outward to where it reached even to international research communities and communities of people in several different countries that's what teaching today, that's one of the big differences. It's not just confined to the four walls of the classroom. It's outside. It's allowing your students to connect with the community and the community to connect with your students and allowing them to be involved in something that's bigger than them and preparing them 
for a future where they will have a positive effect and be an asset to whatever community they land in, whatever job they're in. Hi, I'm Tom Nabb. Welcome to Dodge Elementary, the most dynamic school on the planet. I've been fortunate to be the art teacher here for 30 years, and it's true what they say. Find something you love, you'll never work a day in your life. On the wall, as you enter my art room, we have the definition that we use for art, and it is visual expression, creative work showing, message, meaning, or mood. And I want them to understand that their artwork has that power and ability. Uh, I look about Mr. Nab's art class is um, how fun he teaches people. Those are angel wings. Angel wings. Oh yeah, I have those. Tom Nab's an incredible teacher, not just in art, but for the entire school. He makes a difference in every single child's life, every single day, every single minute, and every single second. Students come back to see him, they request to have him. Our student teachers come back to request to be with him, not just because he's an incredible teacher, but he's an incredible person. Tom is the best kind of teacher. He is patient, he is kind, he is funny. Um, he includes everybody with everything. He doesn't expect kids to do things they can't, he just encourages them. I began the Brick Room Art Gallery, we call it the Bragg, about 20 years ago. It's a space where I tell students that I can brag about their quality work. I try to honor their work in the way I display it in the gallery, in display cases, having the artwork framed. He has so many great qualities. One of the first ones I think of is his passion. Passion for art and passion for education. When my kids come out of his classroom, they are so excited to share what they've created, how they've created it, the materials that they've used, and even the artists that have inspired the work. Coaching has been a huge part of my educational career. I've coached boys volleyball for 36 years. I emphasize sportsmanship in my program because whether we win or lose, we have to learn how to handle that respectfully. It's very important to me and the kids know that that's my number one emphasis. My goal as an educator in the gym is to raise fine young men. He's probably the most influential person to this day. I, I call him all the time when I need help upon something. Even if he has no expertise in that subject, he'll always push me in the right direction. He's just a great overall person. He, he's just everything that one person should be and more. My principal asks teachers to write a mission statement for themselves each year. This year, mine is to provide opportunities and strategies for students to realize their brilliance. We love student in Dr. Collins' class, and she taught me a lot. She introduced me to my New Jersey buddy, Cassidy. She's very dedicated to these children and wants each and every one of them to succeed. It's not, oh, the majority of them got it, so the majority of them get it, great, but we need all of them to get it. Two times six is 12. How are you? All right, how are you doing? Mike and I met each other several years ago. I had an opportunity to connect with his class. It amazes me that we still live in an era where classes are so highly segregated. And I knew we had to do something about it. So I have been connecting with his class room for three years. And I can say that I have students, babies in New Jersey that I can love as I have here in Tennessee. Some of the activities that Dr. Collins has 
started or began at Freeman include the STEM program in which she has selected students to work as a part of the science, technology, engineering, and math program. I love some of the conversations that she has with her students, letting them understand like why she does what she does. I think that helps them to stay focused and stay um, engaged as well. Yeah, she teaches the kids how to study in second grade. She gives them study guides in second grade. She teaches them how to take notes in second grade. I want you to think about how Dr. Collins stay up here late to think about what I could do for you. I miss dinner sometimes with my family. I don't get to talk to my son all the time. I think about you first and I do. And this is a labor of love. You are special. And your future is bright. She is just, has this wonderful personality and we all love her so much. My name is Jamil Siddiqui and I teach at East Bridgewater High School and I just love math. So much can be learned from, from working hard and really struggling with material, but then proving to yourself that you can be good at it. Um, I think I, I learned this lesson early in life. Uh, my mom was a single mom who had three sons to raise, and I would watch her take care of us. And at the time, I was too young to really appreciate it. I really, truly believe that anyone can be successful in mathematics if they're willing to put in the time and they... they
I love coming down here and do it. And what a lot of privilege. So this is the third example, and this is actually recognizing that indispensable, that critical enterprise is even more so now today than ever, interwoven into the fabric of our societies, our teachers, and getting these kids taught in our schools and the teachers and the work they do. The 10 inductees that we're going to recognize here tonight, and the 140 who have come into the hall before them, that is amazing, represent more than 3 million teachers every day investing in the future of our kids. As a nation, we understand that the excellence of teaching is at the center of the success of our schools and our whole country. Our inductees tonight, you've seen their videos, we have shared their stories. They really epitomize this excellence in the profession. And a combined total, as uh, we mentioned a few times, more than 270 years all put together in the classroom among this dull class of 10. As we honor these 10, we really honor all teachers, past, present, and future. Uh, we love the story of East Bridgewater, he has turned out 50 math teachers who are his kids, and, and those 50, and they'll be those 50, and those 100, and on from there. And that's the way it works. So, uh, each of this induction ceremony, we, we celebrate all of you and the excellence of teaching. This evening, our inductees will receive this is kind of the Johnny Olson part of the program. Our inductees receive a beautiful head wrap and 10 karat gold ring from her Jones, or five of them at least. Carol, when they find those other five rings, so you let me know, we're put on the news. When they find those other five rings, the, the ring mystery, not all over it. So the 10 karat gold ring from her comes. The cast bronze metal tower structure, we've had these every year. These are by John Forsyth. And man, these are heavy. So I hope you brought an extra suitcase in the tent. We'll get this beautiful belt. The ring for the five. The print of the one room schoolhouse personalized by the artist Greg Burns with your name, the year of induction. That's from American Fidelity of Shirts Company. We have a proclamation signed by our Governor Warren Kelly proclaiming today as National Teachers Hall of Fame in Kansas. Earlier gifts from Cobb's Football Playoff Foundation and from the City of Emporia. You'll be attending the Pegasus Friends Education Summit, featured speakers in Orlando. It's coming up June the 26th, very soon here, June 26th through 29th, and special events at Disney World because you are all the famous. In addition, our special thanks to the Emporia community donors and the volunteers. We want to thank our corporate and our education partners. They generously always support the National Teachers Hall. In the mission of honoring all teachers in America this year. And they are the education partners, the NEA National Education Association, the NEA Foundation, the American Federation of Teachers, the NEA and AFT State Affiliates, Security Benefit, Pegasus Friends, which will be going to the Senate, California Casualty, the College Football Playoff Foundation, the Jane and Bernard Regal Foundation, and Portia State University, Arkansas College, American Fidelity Assurance, Curve Jones, Final Springs guys. E.L. and the Ivory Hopkins Foundation, the Emporia State Federal Credit Union, the Preston Family Trust, the Ted Dinner's Myth of EDU 21C, Dalio Foundation, D A L I O Dalio, and the Global Government Center for Unsung Heroes. A special thank you to the news media for the wonderful local and the national coverage of the induction of all this week this year. So let's have a round of applause for all those people who make it. who are literally like police or fire or first responders. Of course, sadly, we have educators who have died in the line of duty at the National Memorial. It's just right up at the entrance to fallen educators in the dedication ceremony we have today. Dr. Tony Salvatore, a former Newtown Connecticut administrator, and his wife, Nancy. Are you here from Sandy Hook? Tony and Nancy, right over here. Would you give them a round of applause? For you? We, we will never forget Sandy Hook either. We will never, ever forget that. And uh, Stephanie and Caleb Smith, they're from Peace Bunny Island, Minnesota. 
They share what they have. Our comfort practice with the attendees. Are you here? Would you please stand up and be recognized? Are you going to Uvalde soon? That's true. And everyone's back at the hotel to get the money, so we'll be back. Right, right. Thank you for doing that for them. They are hurting, hurting badly, and uh, they would love to see that and, and will appreciate your visit. So uh, thank you, the four of you, and more for being here on our college educators. I'd like to ask for just a moment of silence for also uh, Ava Morales and Bernard Garcia, who we put on the line this morning. And for all the others, thank you. Well, education is so important in Kansas. Every year, the reps from the education world, they come to bring congratulations to the inductees and to welcome our visitors, and we sure love that support. So now with the readings, we have from the Kansas State Board of Education, Mr. Jim Porter. Jim, come on up. Jones, who is already stood up. I want to congratulate all of you for being here. Welcome to Kansas. Like uh, Sherry Swans earlier, I am a music teacher, and it's very difficult for us to not have a little choir practice right now. But, but I'll, I'll avoid that temptation. Every year, for the last several years, I've had the honor to speak at this group, and I'm always, when I talk to this group or when I talk to people like the, the Teachers of the Year in Kansas, there's some common characteristics that I always find. And that not only are they outstanding, actually rock stars, but they talk about other people that they work with every day who are also rock stars. They are the best of the best, but they are representative. They are representative of the thousands of outstanding teachers. And we need to make sure that we as citizens of this country Honor and respect every teacher that does it makes a difference for our kids every day. And I cannot speak without telling a story. And I have a limited number of stories. So some of you have probably heard this one before, and if that's the case, I apologize. There was this man that thought he had, and actually he was a teacher, and he thought he had a kosher child. So he was going to teach his son about geography. And he taught him about you know, these are the countries of Asia, these are the countries of Europe, these are the countries of North and South America, these are the countries of Africa. And like all teachers, you have to have an assessment. To make sure that you're successful, you have to have an assessment. So he got this map of the world, a huge map of the world, laid it on his uh, family or anything, but we cut it in pieces and scramble. And he asked his son, now I'm going to go in the other room uh, and you uh, assemble the map. Well, in about a minute, his son came back. And so he thought, okay, he's coming back to ask me some more questions. Uh, and so, you know, because I, I probably need to, to re reteach. But the son said, no, I'm done. And he said, what? It can't be done. So he went in expecting to see it and just cranked it into the perfect order. And he said, how in the world did you do this? And he was expecting to say, because you're just a new teacher, Dad. But that wasn't what he said. He said, I turned the picture over. And there were a whole lot of kids. And I thought, if I put the kids together, the world's going to be all right. What you do every day puts the kids together and it contributes to making the world be all right. This is either the third or fourth time I've had the opportunity to be in this venue. And I'm on the menu for the Kansas Teachers of the Year every year, and I have never made a political statement. And probably shouldn't, but I'm going to. It is unconscionable 
that every student and every teacher cannot walk into their classroom every day and be saved. the 500,000 kids in Kansas and the teachers in Kansas and the people that are involved in education in Kansas more than we care about whether or not we are re-elected and we do not deserve to be re-elected. <laughs> when a tragedy happens, we hear the same talking points every time. People go to their cars and say the same thing. If I told you you need to support this position or that position, you can quote the words. Every one of us can do that because we elect people that are more concerned about being reelected than solving problems. We need to send people to Washington, in Kansas, to Topeka, and your state capitals that are more interested in solving problems than they are in being reelected. It is absolutely incumbent. The problems are solved. Every problem is solved with common sense. So we need to elect people that are willing to listen, that have common sense, and are willing to put, to get out of their corners and come together and solve problems. So honored to be able to honor you because you are outstanding. You are rock stars and represent thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands of additional rock stars. Congratulations. I can't congratulate you enough. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Parker. I do want to hold up some of you back. Jim and I could do this together. This is the proclamation from the governor, and everybody will receive that. The National Teachers Hall of Fame Day in the whole state of Kansas. So that everyone will see. On the heels of what Jim said, we came up with a slogan. It's just a thought that a few of us had. There should always be more teachers in the hall than there are on the wall. And that's kind of stuck with us, too. So we'll only go with this. Well, we're going to turn our attention now to uh, the family of inductees that we've invited back to campus. Norm Kanar, class of 2007. Norm, come on up here, and uh, we're going to have some of our previous inductees on here as well. Thank you very much. We have some returning members of the National Teachers Hall of Fame. Reminds me of a paraphrase. Robert Frost, where you walk into the woods and you see roads that diverge, and you take the one less traveled by, and that makes all the difference. And these teachers that we are inducting tonight and the returning members, you've taken the road less traveled by, and it's made a difference. We all know that so much. Uh, will you stand when I call your name and then please not applause when we finish? We have from the class of 2018, Brad Upshaw from Tennessee, California. Brad? From class of 2014, Gary Kaufman from Litzfield, Michigan. Class of 2013, Daryl Johnson from Smithville, Missouri. Myself from the class of 2007 from Fort Scott, Kansas. Class of 2006, Pat Graff from Albuquerque, New Mexico. And last but certainly not least, someone that we honor 
so much tonight, and we owe so much to the class of 2003, Carol Strickland from Emporia, Kansas. Thank you, Norman. Thank you, and Dundee's for returning to celebrate again this year. We love the ones who come back and are very devoted to the cause and the appearances that they make on behalf of the hall. Well, it's an honor, uh, honor to call your attention to special educators that were being honored tonight, and their stories are being reprogrammed. Uh, the first is the NEA Education Support Professional of the Year, and it's Deborah Warren Mitchell. She's from Illinois. And the Lifetime Achievement Award was presented in Washington this year to Mary Edwin Cottrell, who's dedicated six decades of her life to establishing equity and equality in public education for all kids and teens. We congratulate and we want to thank these two outstanding women for what they've done for education. Well, now let's uh, get ready with what you've been waiting for. You got a glimpse of them during the videos at dinner. We would introduce the teacher and play their video, but you've seen the videos and you can, what can you do, remember? Scan your QR code and see them again. Share those on Facebook. And if you have to say you have any trouble figuring out how to scan a QR code and, and uh, download the video and share it on Facebook, ask your grandchild. That's what I do. They'll show you these kids. I tell you, these kids are just taking to it. So they'll give you some assistance when you get home. They'll be glad to do that. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to bring them all up here. The first five. This is the 2020 class, which we really wish we could have done in 2020. But uh, Andrew Biker, Andrew, Dr. Melissa Collins, Donna Brindell, and uh, Thomas Nab, and Jamil Siddiqui. Would you come on up in our class of 2020? <laughs> Introductions going here. Uh, you can also read the details about their amazing lives along with the videos you've seen in your souvenir programs. But we're going to give them more time to share their stories here at the podium. This class is super special in their passion for teaching. And we can talk now as Andrew Byron in his 28th year, teaches eighth grade social studies at Springville Middle School in New York. And Drew, take away the podium to all yours. And Jim, thanks for speaking truth to power tonight and saying what was on every one of our minds. <laughs> All right, to, to start it off, I want to tune down these inductees tonight from that Buffalo, New York is, is their hometown. But tonight, I'm here as an honor of Kansas, right? We are. Some of you were lucky to be born here and others are adopted like I am. And through the amazing work of God, in the Lowell Wilkins Center, that's in Fort Scott, where I met several years ago. But for my, for all of you in Florida, I feel like Alexis de Tocqueville, the Frenchman who came and observed America. I observed a lot about you, and there's a lot of great history. Not only did your community create Veterans Day, not only did your community create the memorial of Quam Magic. But you also created the National Teachers Hall of Fame. Now let's focus on veterans for a second. We all know that they deserve more than any to be honored. But on the other side of that corner, important for you, you honor teachers who defend our country just as much through creating civic engagement, educated, literate, caring citizens who know about the world. So way to go. And I want to talk about William Allen White a little later on. But for starters, I, I like, I think all the nominees are going to uh, really agree with me. There's no such thing as an individual achievement. Like, come on. I called up my fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Brown, today, age 84, and I texted Bob Scott, who 
Dr. St. Joe's. And the late Morgan Sweeney told me I should get the heck out of Motown Restaurant Management and study politics. Those are the people this award uh, should be given to. My name's not, but their fingerprints are all over it. And this uh, belongs to my wife, Mary, who uh, commuted for three years so I could teach in a small town called Panama, 120 mile commute every day for three years with my son, Mitch, in the backseat of his who couldn't come here tonight because of rain um, and being stranded at, at the airport. She breastfed on the highway. He did amazing things, so I can be here tonight. And I'm honored and thrilled to not only have here or here, but my daughter, Margaret. And uh, both kids are having their careers in public service. So the same goes out to my superintendent, who was in the Detroit airport, James Piazza from Springfield. You believe it or not, there was a, a, a tornado warning in Boston, New York last night. They had a real tornado warning here. I mean, you guys see that every year. That one was real, but I'm trusting. But to my friends, teammates, school board members, administrators, colleagues in Panama, Springfield, those of you who call me Grasshopper and dealt with me for 25 years in the nation, Joe Conference, pictures right next to mine in, in, the, in, the, in the Hall of Fame, to the students and the parents and the hundreds of kids who call me Mr. Byer, and those of them in the Human Rights Club, it's a privilege to be on a lifetime, lifetime contract. And to everyone watching this at 106 tonight, and all for me from organizations and cultivated by leadership, thank you. And especially to the, the group that helped co-found the Academy for Human Rights and the Educators, Educators Institute for Human Rights, this is your moment. And it underscores the importance of training teachers on so many important topics that our work has just yet to be done on climate change. So what does this award mean for me? Simply put, what a society What's in you its teachers is it going to, it's what it's going to get out of its future. Early in this work, I had the, you know, and today, you know, we looked at the museum display cases that honors us, but I wish I could make one for the teachers in the Democratic Republic of Congo who last December walked miles in the dangerous areas to get to an EIHR conference to learn about the Holocaust. They did so looking at Zoom cameras dangerous areas. I come here representing the teachers that I spoke and invited me to speak because of my Hall of Fame designation to a large prison uh, called College Correctional. And I got a chance to speak to their GED students, Dan, Eric, Jerry, Ed, Michael, holy cow. And while this moment means so much, Carol, that moment meant a little bit more to be in front of roughly 50 prisoners who know that the only way out of that prison is through the classroom. Now, back to William Allen White, who, you know, created this modern town in so many ways. But what I found so attractive about his biography is that he took out the Ku Klux Klan. And given in my home city of Buffalo, which faced, faced the darker forces of our human nature last month, I'm gonna use this award is a foundation and inspiration to walk in white's footsteps to make sure that the teachers that we train know that they're on the right side of history, standing up to racism and injustice in our time. So let me end with a quote from the great Holocaust survivor and Dr. Buffalo, Mary Weissman Klein, who her second hometown was in Kenmore. And for those of you who are uh, watching at home from Kenmore, you know where Berger lived until she died in Arizona just in early April. And it goes out to all of my nine uh, fellow conductees tonight and to all the teachers, the three million of them around our country and so many more around the world. She said, to teachers goes my undying gratitude. I know often that a job can be frustrating, but remember on the day you might have been sparking someone's brain at heart, that you might find the world, or it might help the world find peace, or develop a cure for cancer, or write an important children's book. Teaching is first and foremost the world's most noble profession. Teachers are the lowest start for the world. I believe, I believe they should be elevated before all others. Thank you so much.
Ruth, thank you. That was amazing. Now we welcome Dr. Melissa Collins. She is the second grade teacher we're honoring at John E. Freeman Optional School in Memphis, Tennessee. Dr. Collins, would you grace us with some of your words? Where would we be if we dared not dream? As a child, I would dream about being a teacher. I found inspiration in my dad and mom. They were my first teachers. They showed me how to stretch myself when I thought my dream would not come true. My dad is also an educator. And he showed me how to make my dream come true. And I saw him build relationships with his students and football players. He even had a dream for me to go out to college on a full scholarship. Therefore, Dad, you coerced me into <laughs> playing basketball. And originally, his dream for me did come true. I eventually did receive a full athletic scholarship. Through playing sports and being accepted, to Mary State Teach Prep Program, I realized I had to be dedicated and committed to making dreams come true. When I entered the teaching profession, I dreamed of changing lives of each and every student. You see, I teach black and brown geniuses. In my first year of teaching, I saw that even with hope, dreams can be broken into pieces. But with passion and patience, dreams can come true. The pandemic was an unforeseen event that brought us some challenges and it deferred some dreams. We had some losses that united and divided. I lost my mom. We lost other lives. Students lost time from the classroom. Teachers lost time from their students and from their friends. Also, some dreams became cloudy. And those dark clouds did linger. However, as teachers, we look through the clouds to find inspiration in our students, school community, in our cities. We became the essential workers. We became the heroes. We kept it moving, as my mom said, despite the rough day in search of a brighter day. We found calmness for breaking down barriers. Then audacious goals and providing for our students. We continue to dream big for our students because we know they are the future generation that will carry us forward and help us reach higher goals. We see the power of dreams through students at Caleb Smith, please thank him. Through his money therapy. Project. Thanks, Kate, for dreaming. Sometimes people enter our dream to encourage us to not give up, no matter how hard things get. Sometimes people share our dream. If you came from Memphis, please stand up. It is so much grander when others take it to the next level. Sharing in someone else's dream is a selfless act, ultimately rooted in love. 
For example, I see a love. That girl has a National Teacher Hall of Fame in the I love class 2020 and 2022. I'm grateful, Carol, to you for creating faith for a teacher to see their dreams live on. I have discovered a new home. Emporium, you are it. <laughs> you allow me to see how community can dream for the profession. The signs down commercial street and the now that are so big, they seem to never end. Being inducted into the National Teacher Hall of Fame is a dream filled with joy, celebration, and happiness. Thank you to the National Teacher Hall of Fame families, board members, and younger, the community of Emporia, the uh, selection committee, committee all the sponsors, my house mom, Lynn, love you. My current and former principals, Mrs. Parks, Ms. Smith, Howard, Ms. Howard, and Dr. Cole, and all the educators in the world, I accept this honor on behalf of you. Thank you to John B. Freeman, the only school I ever taught in. In 24 years, Memphis Shelby County School District, the very, very organization that supported me to be tonight. Any of you have you in the room? You're the first organization that showed me how to advocate for the profession. And National Board of Professional Teachers said, show me that I could be a teacher leader and I did not have to leave the class room. My personal family and friends. Church family, wife and son, under the leadership of Pastor Campbell. You ain't cool when your pastor comes. <laughs> my dad, I love you. My mom, you are my angel in heaven. And I'm grateful for you. My sisters, Jennifer and Pam. My son, Devon, thank you for allowing me to live my best teaching life. And I have been saving the best for life. I thank him for giving me, for making teaching my calling. I thank him for allowing me to see hope in all the children that I teach. I thank you for allowing the clock to stand still when I needed it to. And I thank you for this day and this moment. His name is God. And I thank God for sure. If I have a thank you and do the work, that dreams can come true. Thank you. I also want to thank my family. 
family, my husband Rich, my friends, Samir, my former student, Brooke, who's sitting there, who's now an administrator, my colleague, Rose Ashwood, my church family in the back, my pastor, Pastor Simon, and his family, and the thousands of students that I've been blessed to teach throughout my career. Teaching has been my calling since 1986, when I began my career in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. I was on an emergency teaching certificate to teach 19 self-contained special needs students, but I had no formal training in educating students with disabilities. My classroom was an old standalone trailer on a hillside separated from the rest of the student body and faculty. My first teacher gift was a squirrel tail. <laughs> my second gift was a rabbit leg. Not just the lucky foot, but the <laughs> leg. That was when I realized the key to teaching is caring. Teaching is about connection. Although that trailer looked decrepit and abandoned on the outside, it became a haven of love and connection on the inside. I have been blessed by God to have some of the most wonderful young people as my students. Throughout my career, my students and I have made connections that have resulted in taking clean water to a village in Canada, creating a low-cost, sustainable fish food and an aquaponic system for an orphanage in Canada, the creation of a sensory room for high school autistic students, and a partnership with our local city to sustainably clean our waterways. But none of this would have been possible without my students, community, colleagues, friends, and family. Education must advance into, into new technology. However, no matter how much technology advances, nothing has ever replaced or ever will replace the human component of teaching. I have traveled to schools where a piece of chalk was cherished as a special tool. I have visited classrooms where students were building drones and seeking to solve world problems in state-of-the-art science labs. The most important thing in the room was not the child, nor the drone, but the teacher. Whether I'm sitting on a plane, or in a taxi, or at a mall or market, when I tell people that I'm a teacher, it always elicits a response. Some tell me about their favorite teacher. Others ask me how I've managed over the decades. But most of them say, thank you. Teaching is one of the few professions that directly or indirectly impacts the life of every person. I'm proud to be a teacher, and I'm honored to be an inductee in the National Teachers Hall of Fame. Thomas Nam is our next one. Thomas, in his 34th year, a K through 4 visual arts instructor at Dodge Elementary School in East Amherst, New York. Thomas Nam, please grace us with some of your words. I don't think it hit me until I was just sitting. 
see how pathetic. Happy birthday. So, if you could all do me a favor, could you all wait? <laughs> Very much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm get through this. Um, <laughs> let's try this. There we go. <laughs> um, I'm so honored to be here today, and especially to be honored with these superhero educators, Donna Drew, Janelle and Melissa, in the class of 2020. And Bob, Chris, Kareem, Leila, and Sergio, 2022's inductees. You all inspire me, and I congratulate you as you officially enter the Hall of Fame. I'd like to thank Carol and the Hall of Fame board, Jennifer, for their work in acknowledging the exceptional work of educators. You are a blessing to our field. I'd like to thank my host, my hostess, Charity, who was the best. I'll tell you, I walked into my hotel room and there was a gift basket waiting for me. And the time we spent together, the dinners, the card games, um, you were awesome this week. Thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge Laura Durr for nominating me for this honor. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues for their collaboration and support. I have been blessed with very supportive administrators over the years have allowed me to pursue leadership and service. A special thank you to my great friend, Brandt, who is here celebrating with me today. Your friendship and love will be more to me than you can know. Education has been taken over by and overemphasizes testing and data. However, I have brought the real data. These types of examples are truly what feeds the soul, and are an indication of when we are truly impacting our students. This is a letter from a parent, my first year teaching in 1989. 89. Uh, oh my gosh, 89. And it was a typewriter. Um, Dear Mr. Man, in September we shared with you our little girl Denise, who was full of dreams. You and your manner of teaching her have allowed for less anxiety in your class and more creativity, fostering the opportunity that a straight line drawn crooked by a child may be continued and become another example of our as commendable. Thoughtful, careful adults like you need to step in to offset some of the messages that today's children are receiving. Thank you for encouraging independence and not pushing children beyond their emotional capabilities. The challenges in your classroom have never been interpreted as pressure. This means you have offered Denise and the other children explanations and reassurances. Thank you for a job well done, Mr. and Mrs. W. As any good educator would, I brought a visual. Success. Mr. Man, best art teacher ever. <laughs> Created by Nico, and co signed by his classmates just to give it more impact. Nico <laughs> just loves them. Um, a second grade, second grader, Ella, she wrote a letter. In my opinion, I think Mr. Nav is the best art teacher in the world. Let me tell you why. When you're done with your artwork, he lets you draw on a sheet of paper or three tiny pieces of paper. <laughs> he is always funny. For example, once he said, the last person up around his table is a stinky marker. <laughs> and thank God I wasn't a stinky marker. <laughs> I love when the, when the children will give me handmade cards and notes. And this is from Anna. I love walking into the art room and seeing all pretty things. I'll now like to share with you two letters uh, from some other parents. And these uh, came in actually last year, both of these letters. 
Uh, the first one is from Ella, a fourth grader. I go K to four. I uh, painted on my wall a crying flag. I wasn't sure what the reaction I would get. I'm reaching out because my daughter Ella was delighted to see the pride flag hanging in her classroom today. She's a kid exploring her gender identity and also one that has lots of conversations about inclusivity. I just wanted you to know your choice was noticed and made a difference for her. Thank you. And then this is from this is from Adam's mom. Adam's now in the 10th grade, as I said, I go up to the uh, fourth grade. My name is Michelle, and my son is Adam. He, he already knew he was going to be a teacher in art, and that he would also be a gay man to do that. You are the single most important influence any teacher ever had on a child. That he could be an educator, that could make a difference in children's lives, and also be gay. Mr. Nav, thank you for being the change you wanted to see in the world. Please know I'm thankful to you for seeing Adam as he was. I know he could be anything he wanted to be, but he wants to affect people like you did for him. You are so great, Mr. Nav, thank you. I'll be forever changed and will always be changed because of your influence. You'll mean everything to Adam, and if any influence of his art came from you, make no mistake, it was from you, Mr. Nav. Thank you so much for making an impact on my child so that he has the opportunity to make his own mark to impact other kids like you. Thank you, Mr. Dad. Love and beyond appreciation, Michelle. And finally, I will share with you a post-it you note. Know, and it says, Mr. Dad is awesome. <laughs> Just true. <laughs> I'm so honored to have been able to do what I have done for over 30 years to work with K 4 students, teaching them art skills, demonstrating creative processes, and helping them find their voices. To have coached boys volleyball for 38 years, to have been chosen to lead within my field. I would be a poor man if I had not done it all. Thank you. It's a wonderful area. So from East Bridgewater, Jamil Sunini, come on up, sir. Kansas. He said to me, and I quote, 
I don't want to be in Kansas. Can't we just stay home? And another thing, why would they keep you in the wood anyway? Are you sure it's not for long? I don't think that Jacob ever turned down an opportunity to visit the poor again. You exceeded the expectations that we had for our host family, which I thought would be impossible after hearing Carol tell me about how much hospitality we received. Thank you. Thank you for your time this week. Tell me about your math. These were the words that changed my life. I, used to, I was working in the Boston University Mathematics Department, and Professor Wilk had become and he'd say that to me. I was a student working there, and he found out that I was an engineer at And he assumed I'd be good at math. And his tutor room was short on tutors. He came to me and he said, Have you ever tutored before? And my response was, No, not really. Since then, I was a little apprehensive about getting into the tutoring business. He asked me how much I made working in the office. I proudly replied, I made five dollars an hour, which was the most I had ever made in my life at the time. And he said to me, Make seven fifty as a tutor, and I said, "You got yourself a tutor." <laughs> I was the first and only person who ever got into education for the money. But that is why I'm so <laughs> That whole conversation has a profound impact on me. It changed the trajectory of my life, as it made me discover two very important things. First thing, I love teaching. At first, I thought I loved teaching math. I mean, there is that beautiful intrinsic value of nature that's inherent in mathematics that, oh, about half a percent of the population sees. But then what I really realized is I loved helping students overcome their fears and be successful. No subject strikes fear in the hearts of students the way that mathematics does. And when I can work with these students and I can get them to believe in themselves and get them to understand that as long as they put in their effort, and gave their best try that they would be successful no matter what their test scores would say. That's why I come back and teach each and every day. It's from that feeling to see my students grow and to overcome their fears. The second thing I realized, relationships are at the heart of anything I have ever found success in. Being a great teacher is all about building relationships. There's a long list of people that help me to get here. This, really, no, this recognition belongs to them much more than it belongs to me, because without them, I would not be standing before you today. First, my mom, who I hope figured out the internet is watching at home right now. <laughs> my mom was a single mother, and she would still need the value of hard work to take, take care of people you love. Be a servant and sacrifice to make other people's lives better. That is what she taught me, and I love her for that mom. Next, my brothers, Jeanette and Jay. They've been there my whole life, pushing me to be the best that I can be, always motivating me, whether it was through competition or through cheerleading. They have been my support since the day I first met them, and I've known them for a very long time. Next, my high school teachers, who I affectionately tell my students that they're their grand teachers, Mr. Hunter and Mr. Dago. They show me what equity really means for students, as they routinely go out of the way, and from time to time, even bend some of the school rules to help me out. Next, Professor Wilk and Professor Dewey. They were my professors at Boston University, and I was able to form a strong bond with them. I realized that teachers were there to help me. They watched out for me, they provided with every opportunity to succeed, and they opened so many doors for me. When I graduated from Boston University, I sent out 40 applications to teaching jobs all over New England. And I had a perfect record. I got 40 responses, and every single one of them was a rejection. I hope they're all watching. Right <laughs> eventually, a year later, I was able to get an interview at East Bridgewater High School, and they eventually hired me. I'm not sure what my principal, Judy Beard, and my vice principal, George Kelly, saw me, but they believed in me after dozens of other schools had passed me by. I was determined not to let them down and make sure that they made the right decision. I hope that I've been able to do that for them, and I hope I've given my students the ability to work hard the way that they need for me. To my friends in the Fairlight family, 
Who knew when my next door neighbor in school invited me over for dinner before my first parent teacher conference almost 30 years ago that we'd still be having dinner every week up until this day? Eric, Daddy, Jim, Bob, Brian, you guys mean more to me than you know, and you understand exactly what my career has been. You've been there with me from big, uh, good times and bad, and I hope you know how much you want me today. In my classroom, I'm known for asking a lot of questions. Sometimes my students are so bored they ask kind of questions I ask during a period. And I think my record is like 273 at this point in time. So I've got a question for all of you out there. Who here loves teachers? Come on, make some noise if you don't. Know. Thank you, my students. I often tell people I love teaching, but sometimes I hate being a teacher. So much of the teacher's focus is on the things that are not important at all. But when I get a chance to focus on my kids, help them succeed, and watch them grow, there is no better job in the world. I said this earlier this week when we were being interviewed on the radio, and I truly mean it. I stand before you today as a member of the National Teacher Hall of Fame simply because throughout my career, I have had Hall of Fame students help me. It is my sincere hope that I've been able to help and support my students in the way those people that I just mentioned to you have supported me through the years. Thank you for this incredible honor. My name is Jamil Siddiqui and I teach at East Bridgewater High School and I just love math. So much can be learned from, from working hard and really struggling with material, but then proving to yourself that you can be good at it. Um, I think I, I learned this lesson early in life. Uh, my mom was a single mom who had three sons to raise, and I would watch her take care of us. And at the time, I was too young to really appreciate it. I really, truly believe that anyone can be successful in mathematics. If they're willing to put in the time and they, they can get the support that they need, then math is attainable for, for anyone. To um, work really, really hard and to see that that work pays off is a completely life-transforming um, experience. Never gave up on any student. He taught us to believe in ourselves, push ourselves when we thought we had reached our limit. I learned so much more than just math from Mr. Siddiqui. He taught me that effort and determination and hard work can go a long way in all aspects of life. 
To date, I have over 15 students who have gone on to become math teachers themselves. Having him teach me a love for mathematics, there is no way that I would be a math teacher today. Jamil helped me to see my full potential as a mathematics student. And to be honest, I probably wouldn't have continued my mathematics education had he let me drop that class. He instilled a, a love and a joy in mathematics, but he also just instilled a love and joy of education and learning for the sake of knowledge and the sake of learning. Because um, I met one teacher who honestly changed my life for the better. And without taking Mr. Siddiqui's AP Calculus class, I would not be the educator or the person that I am today. Until I got into Jamil's class and I saw the depths at which he worked to build relationships and, and work with students, that I realized that being a teacher is my way of helping people and making the world a better place. Everything I have ever learned about growth mindset, I learned 18 years ago from Jamil Siddiqui. But the thing I remember most is how he believed in me. The most important thing he taught me was not calculus. It was that if I believe in myself the way he believes in me, I can do whatever it is I set my mind to. I can't imagine what my life would be like if I hadn't become a teacher. The relationships I've formed with my colleagues, with my students, and even my family, as I met my wife when she started teaching down the hall for me, have been the greatest blessings in my life. I am proud to say that I have been and always shall be a teacher. Hi, my name is Chris Poulos, and I'm a Spanish teacher here at Joe Barlow High School in Reading, Connecticut. Throughout my career, I've endeavored to share my enthusiasm for language and culture with my students, fellow teachers, and our broader community, with hopes of improving outcomes for all kids. Along the way, I've been honored to collaborate with teachers from my school, 
throughout Connecticut and across our nation. Together we've grown as a family and worked to make an impact on our profession. Chris has the most integrity of any teacher, maybe any person I know. He is the type of person who will always do the right thing. And Chris has always promoted innovation and adapted his teaching to best practices. Chris teaches using a structured approach to systematically scaffold information so that all students can find success. One of the things that makes Chris, I think, really unique is his ability to really put teacher voice front and center and also elevate teacher leadership uh, across our, our tri-district. He probed, inquired, and ultimately inspired in me a future vision that I didn't even know was possible at the time. He is a lamb to all the students, their families, the community, illuminating what education can be when done with heart. My students are my greatest legacy. Watching them learn and grow into adults has been the driving force of my professional career. It's been more than just teaching them language, but also teaching them how to be engaged citizens, how to give back, and how to make an impact. Letting my students know that I care through a social, emotional, and academic approach has become my mantra to helping them be their best selves and succeed in school. Mr. Poulos is deeply devoted and dedicated to teaching, perhaps more than any other teacher I've ever known. He always makes sure that he is engaged with his students. He tells stories outside of teaching to make sure that his class is always fun and enjoyable. He's empathetic and considerate. He is fully dedicated to teaching Spanish while creating a welcoming learning environment for students. And well, even he sent my parents a letter letting them know on how my improvement was and he always makes sure that you're doing well. I'm so grateful to have a teacher that is willing to spend their own time and efforts to make sure his students can easily succeed in his class. Soup Club stands for serving our underprivileged and basically what we do is we donate bag lunches and sandwiches to Dorothy Day Hospitality House in Danbury. During COVID, we've been able to donate about 500 lunches to the homeless and we wouldn't have not have been able to do it if it wasn't for Mr. Poulos's help. Of all the lessons I've learned through teaching, if I had one piece of advice to share, it would be to be kind, have fair expectations, and let students know you care. In doing so, we'll ensure that students will come to school engaged and ready to learn, allowing teachers to share their wisdom to enable future generations to grow into productive citizens as they live the lives they dream.
I've been addicted uh, in, in, in dying over the house. <laughs> I've been in the news too long. Inducting five more teachers and inducting ten tonight. So they are all ready to go. Our class of 2022. Sergio de Alba, Robert Fenster, Leila Kubish, Kareem Neal, and Christopher Bolos. Here they are. <laughs> It's lovely to have five of you all here, and we can't wait to officially induct you into the hall here in the next few moments here. We're going to start right now. So as you'll see in the program, these inductees of our class of 2022, and we are back doing this again face to face. These five have equally made such an impact on their students, and we sure look forward to hearing from them. Once again, I think it's been fantastic. You saw all the videos earlier, and to let each of them come right up and, and speak to you. Sergio de Alba is in his 21st year in the classroom, teaching sixth grade at R. M. Elementary in Los Angeles, California. This is Sergio de Alba. Welcome. <laughs> to receive this prestigious recognition. Thank you to Carol Schrippen, Jennifer Baldwin, Dr. Ken Weaver, Lori Capes, the hostess of the Moses. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Collins. <laughs> Scott Gates, the National Teacher Hall of Fame, and the community of Emporio for creating such a special event. What a beautiful experience from a beautiful community. There is no other profession as vital to our nation and success as a people as teaching. My first year of teaching was challenging. I went in wanting to make a difference in the lives of my students. Students have reminded me so much of my childhood struggles and the every obstacles that make success and the attainment of their American dreams so difficult. I contemplated leaving the profession, but continued to get with the colleague. A veteran teacher on our campus who convinced me that I can make a difference. Mrs. Kathy Barnowitz exuded love and perseverance. I remember observing her class. As I walked in, I saw students diligently working. I was, I was in awe. She soon began a different lesson, and one student was continuously off task. She went to that young man and spoke to him sternly but lovingly about how his actions were better. The boy did not seem pleased as she continued her food lesson. But at the end of the day, as students said their goodbyes, this young man stayed behind, apologized to Mrs. Barnett and hugged her. As they embraced, she quietly said, I love you. You are a great student. The emotion on his face surprised me. I knew then that this is what I wanted to do. As I spoke to this incredible teacher, she explained the power of our every action. She emphasized how essential it is to show our students that we care about them and what they mean important. This advice changed the path of my career. I began to ask students what I could do to make their school and learning experience better. The Gateway Program emerged from these discussions and opportunities for various clubs and competitions developed. Sports training escaped to fruition and a garden program came to life. I learned that great things can happen when you hear what students have to say, and I have made it a point to listen ever since. Now these recognitions are never earned alone. I want to thank my colleagues who continue to support their projects and programs and my students who motivate me every day. I want to thank my siblings, Fernando, who was like a second father, Gonzalo, who introduced me to the teaching profession, and Anna, the judge, who insists that I refer to her as your honor. <laughs> I want to thank my mother for the inspiration and how I approach any challenge. She worked as a farm worker for the majority of her life. She set an example for her children. She went to school, learned English, 
Erica J. Bean, and the age of Rigby, graduated from college. She set the model that directed the course of her children's lives. It doesn't matter where you come from, she was saying. What matters is where you want to go. Two teachers, a civil engineer and a judge, are what she was able to raise in the back of the square foot home. That is the American Future Science Project. The promise of American Propeller. I want to thank my partner in life. I met my wife, Lenny, in high school. At a day she didn't want to attend, but her parents made her go. You know I don't deserve her. But I am thank thankful every single day that I found that person that makes me better. Finally, I would like to thank my daughters for giving me a joy and inspiration that cannot be measured. They have grown so fast. People always say that it goes by fast, but you don't really believe them when you're surrounded by great diapers. <laughs> they just started college this year. And then we just finished our sophomore year of high school. And though I miss those special holidays and constant giggles that fill the house when they were small, I am in awe of how they have grown and achieved so many goals. I am so proud of the young women they have become and the beautiful path they have prepared for themselves. Thank you. Mr. Fenster, Robert Fenster, he's going into his 30th year this fall, teaching social studies, 9th and 12th graders at Hillsborough High School in New Jersey. At what town in New Jersey, Robert? It's Hillsborough. It is Hillsborough, New Jersey, Hillsborough High. So here is Mr. Robert Fenster. Having to follow some of these speeches is a very daunting task. Everyone in this room knows that teachers work hard planning lessons grading student work, giving extra help. Even among hardworking teachers, my work ethic pushes the boundaries of what is possible and probably what is healthy. I've been asked why I work so hard, why I'm always tinkering with existing lesson plans and replacing effective lessons with new approaches, why I spend my summers doing professional development. The answer is that I'm acutely aware that I'm running out of time. At some point in the not too distant future, I'm going to retire and I'll no longer have the amazing opportunity to be I'm working with 125 students on a daily basis. But to borrow a phrase from Warren Zevon, I'll sleep when I'm dead. I got this work ethic from my mother, although I didn't always have it. In fifth grade, my teacher greeted my mother at parent teacher conferences with Bobby Lacey Fenster. She wasn't wrong. I was lazy. But there were other underlying there were underlying reasons she made no effort to I suppose her approach might have worked with another student, but it didn't work with me. And in fact, it burdened me for years to come, and I can point to that very moment where my status as a classic underachiever began. With a mere word or phrase, teachers can build a child up and tear them down. It's something I try to remind myself of on a daily basis. I was fortunate to be raised in a home which valued intelligence, intellectual curiosity, and civic engagement. My father's book collection provided constant inspiration for those pursuits, even if that didn't always lead to academic excellence. It wasn't until senior year in high school when I became truly engaged in my education thanks to three social studies teachers, Bob Bednarsik, Jane Puccio, and Hall of Fame class of 2001 inductee Ron Caresso. At Rutgers University, I was inspired and, in, and advised by two professors, David Oshinsky and Wells Teddy. Dr. Oshinsky remains the most effective educator I've ever met and who I measure myself in. Wells taught me more about dedication and commitment over the long haul than I can relate in a four hour speech, let alone a four minute one. In my preparation to the class one teacher, I had the opportunity to observe and work with two titans, John Calamano and Dan Mahoney. They inspired me and shaped me in ways that no methods class could ever teach. They're both gone now, but their legacy lives on in thousands of students and future educators they inspire. Nothing truly prepares you for the moment you close your classroom door and it's just you and your students for the first time. In my early years in the classroom, there were a lot of bumps in the road. But not the tutelage of Toby Can and friendship of Bernadette Coyle and Toby Cansador, my official and unofficial mentors, respectively, I wouldn't be here today. They served as advisors, sounding boards, therapists, and cheerleaders. My building principal, Karen Bayer, provided invaluable support, and valuable support over the years, sharing the love for the school and our student body. 
I owe great thanks to my work husband, Rob Longo. Not only did he nominate me for this award, for the past 15 years he's been my collaborator and consigliere. There are so many more people to thank, my co-advisors, Chris Riles, Karen Rogan, Julian Anderson, uh, Sean Lee, my brothers and sisters in the Hillsborough Education Association, and every administrative assistant and ESP I have worked with, the unsung heroes of education. I stand on their collective shoulders. I would be remiss if I didn't extend my gratitude to Carol, Jen, Ken, and all the volunteers this week. Most of all, to my wonderful host family, Cheryl and Steve, who made me feel welcome. Thank you to my new friends in the class of 2020 and 2022. I greatly admire you. Congratulations to all of you. Finally, I have to thank my wife who, for the past 22 years, has put up with my insane schedule and overcommitments. While it's true she likes her alone time, in my pursuit of becoming the best teacher I could be, I push that to the limit on a number of occasions. I love being in the classroom, but one thing I love more is coming home at the end of the day, even if it's no longer the daytime. Thank you. And we'll get some locations there. Hillsboro, New Jersey is near where? Let's say New Brunswick and Princeton. New Brunswick and Princeton. Uh, Layla, Norwood, Ohio, is that your home and the school in your hometown? Norwood is in Cincinnati. Norwood is in Cincinnati. And, and Kareem's from Phoenix, we know where that is, so we'll talk about that. Layla Kubish is in her 26th year. She teaches English as a second language and Spanish at Norwood Middle and Senior High School in Norwood, Ohio. And here is Lynn. It is a privilege to be here and a treat to be back in Kansas. Last time I came, I was 17, and like my parents who spoke English, I did not. Just before we came, I learned the numbers and could I figured I needed to learn you know, something English before we came. In my new home, right away, I made three discoveries. First, the food. I was amazed by boxed food. <laughs> it's quick, it's easy, and I made purple chicken jello. <laughs> I packed it with my lunch the next day, but it turned into liquid. <laughs> and my mother. The second discovery dealt with numbers. I already knew that instead of the metric system, they used an imperial one. But I, I was puzzled by how people in the US mixed letters and numbers. For example, 503. I had no idea what the O stood for. <laughs> and when I looked on the phone and see letters, and the O never corresponded with zero. <laughs> And then also people segmented, say the numbers in a segmented way, like nobody ever says my area code is 515, instead it's 513. <laughs> my third and best discovery, my teachers at China Mission High School. They were kind, caring, and compassionate in ways I have never known. And it's because of them that I became a teacher. On my journey to getting certified to teach, there was a course called Practice. It's required in a course teaching. And another professor told us that we were placed in a school, but if we're going to teach in a different grade, different subject, or different grade band, that we need to observe one or two schools. I did not know she meant one or two or one or two. <laughs> She probably meant one boat. <laughs> a week later, she said, remember to go visit one to two schools. I'm like, oh, the number grew. <laughs> <laughs> As I visited 123 schools, <laughs> I would ask permission to use this a mini cassette player. It's this vintage lifesaver. And I would record, and then after listening to hundreds of hours, I was going to prepare middle and high schools, and I realized there was a problem. I could not remember if it was middle or high school at the time of recording. 
Sorry, this is again. But because I asked questions, I could tell, based on the questions, if I were talking to a teacher, a principal, a parent, or a student. And because I was fascinated by the English grammar, I noticed that the speakers who were in um, identified as successful schools, they used the present purpose. And a lot of words would be planning, partnership, progress, potential. And words like college and career came up again and again. But in the struggling schools, they used the past tense and a lot of words, hell words, lack, limit, loss. And even the word lame, which I couldn't find a translation for in my language. My professor clarified that she wanted minimum of three pages, maximum of five. So I was relieved it was not 325. <laughs> I realized the mistake that I made, but I carried the lessons for my entire teaching. My takeaway is that our language of hope or lack of immediately impacts outcome. So it was by chance that I served for my entire career at Carnegie meetings, but by choice that I taught as if I were in the richest schools, rich in spirit. I saw my students with their cultural gifts as young people with plenty of possibilities. Thank you so much for choosing me among these amazing educators. I will always cherish my time. Well, I can also be saying the National Teachers Hall of Fame. Let me correct something. So I'm actually. <laughs> 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 and everybody thought I was sad. And when I came to Harvard, people said, Well, we need you to teach your language. I'm like, Oh, you care about my own language. And I said, So what would it be? And I said, Spanish. So I went to Mexico and Guatemala to so learn about the people. <laughs> really, I'm not that. She <laughs> says the same, you say the same. <laughs> Tonight at ten, the Spanish teacher from North Africa. Kareem Neal is 24th year of teaching special ed at Maryvale High School. We said he's from Phoenix, Arizona. Here is Kareem Neal. I think maybe the things I got on the stage 
Um, I talk a lot about building, building strong communities, and I talk about that because of the students I teach. I teach students in self-contained special education programs, and those are students who um, stay with the same teacher most of the day. Um, they have high needs, and uh, a lot of students we, we might need to help be help change uh, and, and those kinds of things. And, um, and, and my students don't often feel like they're a part of schools in the 24 years that I've talked. And so I talk about building uh, stronger communities, and, uh, and that brings me back to my time here. Uh, everybody here has uh, been so welcoming to me, and I wanted to uh, do, do my last thank yous as part of uh, my educational my educational progress and the process and, and, and the way I view education. And so the, the first two people I want to talk about are Stacy and Alex Johnson. Um, since I've gotten here, I, I felt like, you know, like, like I, I felt like I automatically kind of had my little, my little crew, my little family, right? Um, from, the, from the car ride over, uh, I realized one, we had a lot of things in common with Stacy and I. And, um, and two, I realized that even though I came here alone, that I wasn't going to be alone. And, and that is important. Um, when, you, when you think about some of your students and some in your schools, I, I hope that y'all can think about the students who might be alone and lonely. We do have a chance to, not, to help them not feel lonely no matter what is going on. And that's what Stacey and Alex did for me, so thank you for that. Um, and the next, the next people I want to talk about um, are, are my first two teachers. Um, it was my grandma, Maddie Hextall, and my mom, Joyce Neal. And um, it, the reason why I bring them up in, in conjunction with the way I teach is because they, I grew up in a tough place, um, a place where you really had to be tough, right? And um, my my grandma, my mom, gave me reinforcement for things that people weren't getting reinforcement for. So a lot of people saw me in the media. They're like, "Oh, he's really tall. He played great basketball." And I'm sure most of you are not. Yeah, I play sometimes. I always want to say no, but I do play a lot of basketball. A lot of people, oh, he's really cute. He's going to be quite the ladies' man. <laughs> right? That kind of stuff. But my mom and my grandma almost fully gave me reinforcement for my academic activity. So I would watch soap operas with my grandma on the couch. And we watched all my the general hospital, all my children, all my children. And um, my grand, I was, they, they were, you know, they were, they were talking grown up stuff. I was six years old, seven years old, five years old. And I would be like, Mom, what, what did they say? Our grandma, what did they say? Sorry. And she would be like, Go over to the dictionary and figure it out. A dictionary for the young folks in here is like a big book. <laughs> so she would do that, and, and, we were, and I would call her book. And so I would, Breaking keys or something like that, and she'd be like, oh, right? And then when my mom I would be out and about with my mom, and I would say something smart, because you know how kids are. When, once you learn one word, you throw it out there. And she would be like, spell it. And it would be in front of a bunch of people in like Trenton, New Jersey. They're like, this little dude is spelling It's going to be so weird. Another thing. So she would be like, spell that, spell the words. And what, I, what was happening, though, is I had developed this level of learning. Right, because I was getting the reinforcement for that. I wasn't, I didn't, I never developed the love of playing sports. Even, I, I like playing sports a lot. Um, I, you know, I, I never, and, you know, maybe until I was like a grown person, took this great value in the way I looked. But I was all in with learning everything I could. And I think that is part of why I became a teacher today. So I was, I was going through therapy a couple of years ago. I was married, and I was married to a therapist. 
and tell you I would talk about being single too. <laughs> I was going through therapy a few years ago, and my therapist told me to do something. But my mom, they were like, oh, give her a big hug. Because I was like, that's not how my mom gave me that friend. She, she wasn't like a hug, she wasn't on the phone. So we were, in, we were in Jamaica for a family vacation, and I just went and like, hugged my mom. And she was like, oh, my baby. And she started hugging me. I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> And she was just like, well, I, I love the fact that you wanted to hug me. And I was like, Mom, I was talking to the therapist about that. And it was like, oh, when I was a kid, I didn't get love like that. And she was like, when you were a kid, you needed to be tough. You couldn't be a mom's boy. She was like, where we lived, you had to be tough. Right? And she was like, now I can give you that. And the lesson it taught me is you give people love the way they need it, not the way you need it. My mom needed that. My mom wanted to hug me like that. Right? And she said, no, I'm going to give him what he needs. So I want y'all to keep that in mind with the classrooms, because I know a lot of teachers here probably listening. Give them the love they need, not necessarily the kind you like to give them. Right? Um, and, and lastly, before I walk off stage, the students in my classroom, I, I, I was a chemical engineering major. And I changed my, I, I, I worked a special Olympics event one day and I ran into some students and they were the most loved people I've, I've ever met. And I decided to become a special ed teacher. I was a junior college student, so I had a good And when, when I think about how students in schools right now don't have a chance to meet these students, they don't have a chance to have their life changed. these amazing, amazing teachers who have stood up in the audience and that we've conducted tonight. Christopher Poulos is the only person in the world, the only one in the world who can say, I am the 150th teacher oh, yes. in the National Teacher <laughs> Superb, 
and most importantly, my students. They are my legacy, and um, they have made the last 22 years, um, they've reaffirmed my decision uh, to go into this profession, and I love teaching because of them. And I want to thank my family, um, my mom and dad. My mom was a teacher for, for many years. Um, my children, uh, who are not here tonight, this is their last week of school in Connecticut. We've got to be better for them to, to be there. They, they don't know how proud I am of them, but I'm very proud of them. And my wife, Helen, who's here um, with me, and it is without, without her support over the years, I, I would not be here. Thank you, Helen, I love you. I want to share a story. Um, when I received the word of the nomination to the National Teachers Hall of Fame in September, um, I wasn't sure what to do, and I called my principal up, and I said, Gina, I got this, this, this nomination, and, she's, and she stopped me, and she said, Chris, whatever it takes, whatever it takes, you need to try to get this honor. And I thought that was a little odd. And so I listened, and she said, I want you to think about teachers over the last two years. I want you to think about teachers from March of 2020. I want you to think what they did. On a dime, they repurposed their lessons. They went to an online environment so that they could continue to teach their students and that their students could continue to learn. And it wasn't easy. And they had to not only figure out how to deliver the academics, but they had to figure out how to sustain the social and emotional well-being of their students when they were isolated behind a computer screen. They had to figure out um, new technologies. They were building a plane and flying at the same time. They were resilient. They had questions about, should I wear a mask? When am I going to get my vaccine? Are we going to teach all in? Are we going to be remote? Are we going to be hybrid? They were courageous and they were brave. They were professional and they were heroes. And now more than ever, teachers need a spot. And if you receiving this award will put a spotlight on teachers, not just the teachers of your school or your district, not just the teachers of Connecticut, but for teachers everywhere, you will leave this profession in a better place. And so I filled out the application and I completed the video with, with that mindset. And um, tonight, I, I, I'm, I'm very proud, I'm very honored to receive this award. But I received this award on behalf of teachers, not just me or the teachers in my school, not just teachers in Connecticut or Kansas, but teachers everywhere. Teachers across this country and teachers on that memorial that we visited today. Thank you.
Uh, it's not quite official yet until we officially bestow our membership. You may even have thought it was official, not quite yet. So you're, you're, you're almost number 150. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to take a brief walk down memory lane, beginning in early May for you, and to highlight the recent activities for the rest of you in the audience. Uh, and then I will use my power uh, as chair of the board to invest in. So if that's all right, before we do that, on behalf of everyone in this room and so far beyond, please accept our heartfelt thanks and everlasting gratitude for the foundations you have laid to help literally thousands of students become their best selves, and in the process, making all of us better. <laughs> so it began on May 9th when you visited uh, gathered in Washington, D.C., and had a variety of activities that may have left you feeling like you were drinking out of a fire hose, I'm not sure. But you had a backstage tour of the Smithsonian Museum of American History. You met with the Assistant Secretary of the Department of Education and the head of the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education. You had an inspirational evening tour of the Capitol, as referenced earlier, uh, led by Senator Marshall. Uh, you had meetings with Senator Jerry Moreno from Kansas, as well as the opportunity to meet with your individual representatives and senators. And as if that wasn't enough, uh, you were highlighted at the National Education Association luncheon and commended by the NEA president. Then on Monday, in case you have forgotten what has happened this week, uh, you can be for a host of activities in Teacher Camp USA, uh, where we know from what you have said you felt warmly welcomed, embraced, and loved. Uh, you had the opportunity to visit the museum and the memorial. Uh, you were interviewed by KBOB radio station. You did podcasts. You did crafts with kids. Uh, you attended the band concert last night, and you did the famous or infamous, take your pick, chicken dance. <laughs> I'm asking you to do a demonstration tonight. Uh, Memorial, and here we are tonight. So, through these activities, we know from what you have said tonight you have found kindred spirits in all your new best friends, right? For life, likely. Um, and you have come to not only know one another with great affection and admiration, but you learn from one another. And we know that learning will continue. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we believe you have felt the daily admiration and respect of each and every person you have encountered in and for them. So this evening, that is a brief overview of the activities since May 9th. And now we are gathered tonight to celebrate the newest classes of membership in the National Teachers Hall of Fame. What better representatives there are now. And we do recognize that you are putting the spotlight on the noblest of professions, the teaching profession, not just for yourselves and your schools and your states, but for every member in the teaching profession. So, with the power invested in me by the National Teachers Hall of Fame Board of Trustees, I now declare you members of the National Teachers Hall of Fame.
And then my family, we have a toast that we learn only for the most special of occasions, and it is this. Here's to you. There are no ways. And now I would like to call on Pat Brown, member of the class of 2006, to issue the call. Good evening. Oh my goodness, this is so cool. First of all, before I do the charge, I just want to say, I know we said a lot of stuff tonight about her, but Carol, you are the picture of grace under pressure. <laughs> and those of us who knew you before March of 2020 knew it, but now the whole world knows it after COVID. Thank you for all that you handled. I am back here for my sixth induction banquet, and that's because of the people of Emporia. Let's thank them one more time. For I also want to point out that my pen is right here. I wear it everywhere when I'm going to any educational thing. And my ring is right here. I won't show you which finger. <laughs> but it's right next to my wedding ring. And I'm very 24 7. All right, to our new inductees, would you please stand? On behalf of the members of the National Teachers Hall of Fame, I congratulate you on receiving this very prestigious honor of being inducted into the National Teachers Hall of Fame. In receiving this award, you are representing the millions of exceptional teachers who are entrusted with helping to mold the minds and lives of the children and youth of America. With this award come certain mandates and responsibilities which you must accept and continue to perpetuate. You must continue to promote excellence in the classroom, to encourage integrity, professionalism, honesty, compassion, and dedication for those in the teaching profession, and be a strong advocate for the best possible learning environment for every child and every youth. You must also continue to accept the responsibilities of being an excellent role model for students, teachers, parents, and the communities in which you live and where you teach or have taught. During the four days you have been here in Emporia, preparing for this important occasion, you have witnessed the love and admiration of other Hall of Fame members of those associated with the Hall of Fame and the public at large. When all the festivities are over and you are returning home, you will then realize what a wonderful experience it has been and the humbling honor you have received. If you can accept this honor in humility, assume your responsibilities with willingness and vigor, Remember, you are representing all other exceptional teachers throughout the country and gratefully acknowledge the help of many, many people in your journey toward this day. Please say, I will. I will. You are definitely worthy of this title. <laughs> Member of the National Teacher Hall of Fame, congratulations and God bless you as you continue to serve the most precious people on earth, our children. Welcome to the National Teacher Hall of Fame.
Each one is inscribed with their okay, name. They're all personalized. So and I'm not sure these are in alphabetical order, uh, but we will call forward first Robert Finster. <laughs> Sergio Teacher, 
she was. She looked at Tommy and said, we haven't heard from you yet. What would you like to do with me when you grow up? And he said, I want it to be possible. And the teacher, without missing a beat, said, well, Johnny, I don't believe we have studied that career quite yet. Can you help us understand what that is? And he said, well, it's like this. I have two older brothers, two older sisters. They are always telling me how impossible I am. When I grow up, I want to be possible. And the connection between that story and Carl Strickland is this. For each and every one of us gathered in the room, she has made us possible in some form or some fashion, as she has with the, all of the students whose lives she has touched. So, Carol, thank you for bringing up the possibilities in each and every one of us. And now, on to the formal truth. Uh, as we gather together to celebrate the magnificence of you, uh, an honor of you, of Carol, it's always already been referenced that she was a 2003 inductee into the National Teacher Hall of Fame. She became the executive director of the Hall of Fame in 2013, or should I have said 2013, like <laughs> Executive Director Carol had a distinguished career in education. She graduated from Texas Christian University with a bachelor's degree in communication and English and a master's degree in communication. Carol spent 29 years teaching English and coaching forensics and debate um, at middle and high schools in Colorado, Oklahoma, and Kansas, and then another five years as a college instructor. One of her most noteworthy and valued accomplishments per Carol was implementing uh, an applied communication class for students with limited English proficiency to help them transition from high school to college. With Carol's leadership, the National Teachers Hall of Fame has thrived. Uh, the financial support we have received from Marriott Partners has been referenced more than once, and I draw your attention to the back of the program, and it is all due to Carol's relationship building, uh, because it all begins and ends with relationships, right? Carol's enduring respect and admiration for the inductees was the catalyst to expanding the Hall's mission from honoring exceptional career teachers to including and leveraging their skills and experiences to elevate the teaching profession and to recruit future teachers into that profession. Induction now involves that very active activity that we took a walk down memory lane recently about. Uh, and through Carol's leadership, the Fallen Memorial was incepted, and through Carol's leadership yet again, it became a national monument and the only national monument in Kansas. In 2012, Education Drives American Tour then Secretary Arnie Duncan stopped in Victoria to visit the MTH and to meet with Carol. He was as mesmerized with her as we all are. Later in 2012, the tragedy at Sandy Hook then was the catalyst for the memorial for fallen educators. Her accolades are many, and here is just a short list because there's not enough time left in the evening to cover them all. Uh, but she has earned the Diamond Award for Forensic Coaching, the U.S. Department of State. Secondary School Excellence Award, the Kansas Speech Communication Association, High School Speech Theater of the Year, Kansas Master Teacher, Teacher Exchange Ambassador to Ukraine, USA Today, All USA 17 Teacher Award, Who's Who Among American Teachers, Presidential Award for Volunteer Service for President George Bush, President Service Award from the Association of Teacher Educators, 
England's magazine icon of education and induction into the National Teacher Hall of Fame. Carol, because of your leadership, your passion, your tireless energy, you, you made the Energizer Buddy look lazy, I guess. Um, what, what, what you have done to bring the National Teachers Hall of Fame to this point, and the foundation you have set for a trajectory that is like this, it is nothing short of phenomenal. Uh, and we wish you the best in retirement. Uh, the great news is she is staying on in a consultative capacity. And the even better news is she can run, but she cannot climb. So, Carl, I would ask you to come forward, please. And then I would call on Gary Koppelman and Brad Upshaw for a presentation on behalf of the NTHF Advisory Council. Many of you may have gotten a personal little thank you note from Carol through the years. I want this to be the biggest thank you note from this ballroom through the past into the future. Uh, a thank you to Carol, and this is uh, a tribute from our advisory council, another one of her great ideas. Uh, handmade Jennifer Williams from Idaho sent this, and others have sent messages too, but we don't want to take any time. She is not learning the, letter, the two letter word no. <laughs> uh, one more presentation and then we'll, we will give you equal time. So, uh, because a picture is worth a thousand words, uh, and due to the supply chain issues, uh, we do, on behalf of the board, have this piece of art to, to deliver to you when we get it. It's <laughs> with the Earth Jones rings. <laughs>
And then by the fourth grade, I decided I wanted to be a teacher because I loved Joel Scott, who's my fourth grade teacher. And in fifth grade, I got in trouble because I told my music teacher that when I became a teacher, I was never going to treat children the way she treated us. <laughs> And then I think my mother said something like, well, you've destroyed the love of music, so maybe you need to think about that. So, that's kind of been the story of my life. And you see why I'm so passionate, not just about students, but about educators. And in today's world, I think we need to fight for education, and we need to fight for educators. And I'm stepping back from the role. Um, my husband needs me more than I can do in a full-time job. And, and I give you only some part-time and I want to work with kids to, to make the Hall of Fame and get bigger and better. Um, but I will always be here in the audience enjoying this event because this has been so much a part of my life. To work with the Board of Trustees and the community of Euphoria, uh, I can't replace that ever. And these things are symbols of what this means to me. And I'm just so indebted to all of you for this. And um, just let me tell you, this night is about those people out there, not about me. So please give them your gratitude. They are the future of the Hall of Fame because they're the ones who are going to be our ambassadors going out talking about Euphoria, Kansas, and about the National Teachers Hall of Fame and the National Memorial. So to all of you who have supported us through the years, I am truly grateful. And for all of you who come back each year and you help support us, thank you. And Kim will do a wonderful job, and someday we'll get maybe hopefully an inductee who's retiring soon who would love to move to Emporia and be the executive director at the time. So I will be here next year. I hope you will be here next year. And rounds come up before I start crying. <laughs> Hi, my name is Chris Poulos, and I'm a Spanish teacher here at Joe Barlow High School in Reading, Connecticut. Throughout my career, I've endeavored to share my enthusiasm for language and culture with my students, fellow teachers, and our broader community, with hopes of improving outcomes for all kids. Along the way, I've been honored to collaborate with teachers from my school, throughout Connecticut and across our nation. Together, we've grown as a family and worked to make an impact on our profession. Chris has the most integrity of any teacher maybe any person I know. He is the type of person who will always do the right thing. And Chris has always promoted innovation and adapted his teaching to best practices. Chris teaches using a structured approach to systematically scaffold information so that all students can find success. One of the things that makes Chris, I think, really unique is his ability to really put teacher voice front and center and also elevate teacher leadership uh, across our, our tri-district. He probed, inquired, and ultimately inspired in me a future vision that I didn't even know was possible at the time. He is a lamb to all the students, their families, the community, illuminating what education can be when done with heart. My students are my greatest legacy. Watching them learn and grow into adults has been the driving force of my professional career. It's been more than just teaching them language but also teaching them how to be engaged citizens, how to give back, and how to make an impact. Letting my students know that I care 
through a social, emotional, and academic approach has become my mantra to helping them be their best selves and succeed in school. Mr. Poulos is deeply devoted and dedicated to teaching, perhaps more than any other teacher I've ever known. He always makes sure that he is engaged with his students. He tells stories outside of teaching to make sure that his class is always fun and enjoyable. He's empathetic and considerate. He is fully dedicated to teaching Spanish while creating a welcoming learning environment for students. And what even he sent my parents a letter letting them know on how my improvement was and he always makes sure that you're doing well. I'm so grateful to have a teacher that is willing to spend their own time and efforts to make sure his students can easily succeed in his class. Soup Club stands for serving our underprivileged and basically what we do is we donate bag lunches and sandwiches to Dorothy Day Hospitality House in Danbury. During COVID, we've been able to donate about 500 lunches to the homeless and we wouldn't have not have been able to do it if it wasn't for Mr. Poulos' help. Of all the lessons I've learned through teaching, if I had one piece of advice to share, it would be to be kind, have fair expectations, and let students know you care. In doing so, we'll ensure that students will come to school engaged and ready to learn, allowing teachers to share their wisdom to enable future generations to grow into productive citizens as they live the lives they dream. I was inspired to teach because when I came to the U.S., I did not speak English, but felt the kindness my teachers extended in ways I have never known. As a word language and ESL teacher, I strive to expand my own worldviews, learning from and connecting with educators, leaders, and parents. I bring that knowledge and connection to empower and inspire youth to help them address issues in ways they impact change. Walking the path to advocacy helps me bring the skill set to my students. To me, unfair means to unlearn that someone, somewhere, silently and alone will resolve the issue. We can serve as role model to lead them to make change. A few years ago, my students expressed a need for ways to deal with stress. Research led me to study yoga. With the help from my school leaders and their family support, my students converted storage space into a yoga studio. Through the process, they connected with each other while making a difference. I believe when there's a will, there's a new skill. It means we must be willing to learn new things to move forward making a change they deem important to them. I want students to access multiple resources. Technology is an integral tool, but ultimately, I want them to connect with their own community members and learn from diverse people and perspectives. We don't always have to go far. Diversity is all around us. During a national student walkout occurred a few years ago, my students expressed a need to have voice and visibility. Connecting them to their community is always my priority. Youth Voices in Greater Cincinnati was launched, a TV talk show that allows them to invite experts to engage in talks about topics that matter to them. A parallel program, Voices Without Borders for those who speak another language. Teaching requires adaptation. During the pandemic, they aspired to learn how to cook to help at home during remote learning. The show turned into a teen cooking show, Chow and Tell, a program where they make and take the meal to share at home. As they learn to cook, they connect with guest community leaders. Children can achieve anything. We need to engage them to dream big. I inspire them to look beyond circumstances, and excellence is not a matter of geography. Regardless of the communities or district's resources, partnerships and connections help us to rise above any lack or limitations. Hello, my name is Kareem Neal, and I've been a self-contained special education teacher for 21 years. I've taught at Maryville High School for the last 13 years. My philosophy on teaching is building community. So I've built a really strong community in my classroom, and it's kind of a family-type atmosphere in there. Like, 
For instance, many of my students, if you ask them what their favorite day of the weekend, they'll say it's Monday because they get to come back to school. To me, it was like the best thing for me, being part of your class, doing a lot of learning and doing a lot of great, interesting stuff with my class. It's amazing all the wonderful things that he's involved in and how he supports the school community and the larger community uh, around us. Um, he's well known for his work with his students in reference to really supporting, helping them build leadership skills, taking them out into the community. Um, each of his students arrive every single day just excited and filled with just a sense of purpose when they get onto this campus. Um, knowing that they're going to have a wonderful experience with Mr. Neal and his classroom assistants. I was placed in Mr. Neal's CBT classroom my senior year as a student assistant and this is when I really got to see Mr. Neal as a teacher, not just inside the classroom but outside. He didn't just walk in, teach a lesson and walk out. He would walk in and get to know his students individually and as a whole. He would get to know the communities that they come from, their abilities, their strengths, and about and their cultures. Just seeing how he is inside the classroom made me want to become a teacher. I wanted to be Mr. Neal. So I decided to go on after graduation and get my education degree, um, which I successfully pursued and I am now teaching at the current high school that he works at and the former high school that I met him. I'm often making sure that our inclusive efforts are a little bit different than the traditional my students sit into a class. I also invite other students to come into my class so that they can view my students so that we can build that full school community because I do feel like most school communities have special education classrooms as a bit separate and that is not really the way for peers to interact with other peers. Um, I feel like the whole school needs to be a family type environment because everybody can learn something from everybody. I know when I got into the field um, and I started working with students with special needs, their authenticity really got to me and it was a big reason why I've stuck with it this long. And I feel like if everyone gets a chance to meet all of their peers and everybody gets a chance to interact with everyone, they can gain, gain those kinds of gifts that you can't gain from just staying in your own box. I can remember Mr. Fenster staying with us until 6 p.m. in mock trial, Model UN, helping us in social studies. It's about 6 p.m. right now, and I just got home because I was working with my students, mock trial, Model UN, social studies. Mr. Fenster was an inspiration for me to become a teacher, and for that, I'll always be thankful. He's the reason I became a teacher, uh, and I hope in teaching that I can pass on even a tenth of what he gave to us uh, in dedication, in compassion, in respect, in loyalty. I didn't fully appreciate him as an educator until I became a history teacher myself and discovered just how much time, work, and thought goes into creating educational experiences of the caliber that he presented to us. He always pushed me to be better, but at the same time always defended and supported me when I needed that as a student. He impacted my pedagogy and he helped me think differently about the world. And I try every day to bring that to my students. And when I think about the future people in our country that I am helping to build, I think about the type of students that Mr. Fenster helped to build. And I really, even today, consider um, Bob Fenster to, to continue to be my teacher, um, as well as my advisor, my coach, um, my mentor, and my friend. One of the most important things I took away from being his student teacher was to be self-reflective, to think about my lessons even when they go well, what can I do to make them better? He was instrumental in, in teaching me at that time in my life that um, who I was mattered. And he teaches students how to love the work, love learning. I believe that Mr. Fenster is truly one of the most impactful people in my life in giving me the ability to be kind and to be strong in everything that I do. There are few parts of who I am today that don't in some way tie back to something that Mr. Fenster taught or did for me. You know, Mr. Fenster, I just want to thank you so much for changing my life. Mm -hmm.